Ja, ga denk ik. Uh, gaat de fiets er ook? Belangrijk. Ik heb niet voor niks gepakt. Een beetje naar daar aan. Zo. Ja, wij het kunnen. Nou, dat was niet jou. Mooi zijn. Nee, nee, nee. Dit is echt Ik wil niet zeggen dat ik van Heel goed, heel goed. Keep you running. That's good. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> take one. <laughs> Wait, you're, you're taking a photo of me. Wow, you just ran. Two grand. Awesome. Is that what you just said? Yeah. It's <laughs> funny, my wife would appreciate that. Yeah, like, I know, movies. that's why I'm saying <laughs> It's like the classic Nothing romance oh. comedy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's get to the business. All right. <laughs> so, business? Guys, I'm excited to share with you guys about the second principle called audience of one. But kind of before I get into the talk, um, just wanted to remind you all of really what the principles are. These AIA principles that you all are going to be learning in the mornings. What they are is really the gospel applied to sport. It's the gospel experienced in sport. It's the gospel applied to sport. So we're talking in the language to athletes, the language that you guys can understand. And so what we're going to wrestle with is a few questions. What you all did yesterday with Jan and learn is what motivates me. We learned about God's unconditional love should be our ultimate motivator, even in our sport. So today, I'm going to be, we're going to be asking and wrestling with the question, who or what do I worship? And then in the next few days, we're going to learn about how do I grow? So how do I grow spiritually? How do I deal with pain? This is going to be a talk I'm going to give here in a couple days. And then the last one is, how is it important how I live today? And so before I get started, I want to introduce you all to my awesome family. And so if you guys give a little picture of like my wife. This is my wife, Tabitha. Can you see? Mm -hmm. Well, and then this is uh, my son, Logan. And he's five months old, and this is this is me and him um, on the ground the other day. And so it's funny he he sleeps like this, like this every day, and so he does it all the time. It's like the funniest thing. But um, they are with my in-laws, my wife's parents in Orlando, Florida, right now. And I just wanted to give you guys an idea of who I'm talking with at FaceTime at night <laughs> as uh, with my wife and son, and I miss them a lot, wish they were here, but kind of that's my family, and my background though is in sport, and so I competed in the sport of cycling, and that's why I'm here. I'm in full-time ministry to reach pro cyclists, um, guys and girls, but you know, I love sport, and I love the sport of cycling. I think, I want you guys to think, do you think that the sport is a beautiful thing? Do you think cycling is a beautiful sport? Would you guys agree? What makes yeah. it, do you think, a beautiful sport? What makes it amazing to you? Freedom. Your freedom? Yeah, just by yourself in the mountains. I mean, yesterday, just you know, my cell phone's in my yeah. back pocket. I'm not checking my email. Um, I love that. What about anything else, the freedom of it? Well, being out there in nature. Yeah, being out there in, in nature, God's creation, which we saw on display and pretty magnificent display yesterday. Get your head empty. Your head empty, don't think about no. the weight of the world and maybe stresses in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for me, growing up, I started riding a bike at 12 years old and I was really young. And so what, what got me is I got out of my neighborhood. And I got in the woods, I, I grew up mountain bike racing. And so, I'd just be out in nature and the trees and the mountains, and my mom would be back home, <laughs> not telling me what to do. And I, and I started to grow in the sport and get better and better. And um, when I was 18 as a junior cyclist, so where Cora's age, I went to the world championships with the US, and it was a lifetime dream. I went to Austria, and so I might have told you guys about a ride in the Gloss Glockner, but <laughs> raced the world championships, and. And then I switched on to road cycling. So what we're doing here this week, um, I switched over there to the road to kind of continue my career. And then I went to the, lived in Europe and is it him Belgium with the under 23, which is 19 to 22 year old cyclist 
in Belgium. So the whole US national team, we wanted to get our face kicked in by all the Europeans, which they did a really good job, by the way, of really beating us really bad. And then I did two years professionally. And it took me all over the world. I loved it. And I think the sport, and I believe God created sport to be an amazing thing. And I have a second question to ask. Do you think sport, and even the sport of cycling, can be a destructive thing? Yes. In what ways do you think? When you go too far in your sport, it, uh, it takes you, uh, how do I say that? <laughs> then we, you, in, in the slug names. Yes. Preoccupies you. You can be in an uh, obsession. An obsession. Mm -hmm. Real top sports is not healthy anymore. No. I mean, you have to live such a disciplined life with all kinds of, um, I will not call them performance enhancing substances, but mm -hmm. the, the slippery slope towards that <coughs> is, is very uh, near, uh, around the corner all the time. Yeah. So kind of the where maybe sport becomes everything, you'd say, your whole con complete consumption of who you are. I've got a video that I found, I think it will re relate really well to you guys, of football, okay. which in America we call soccer. So I want you guys to watch this video. Can you guys see it? Huh? Yeah. He's sharing in the analogy of sport as religion. You need somebody to belong to. You need someone who is constant. You know, what, I mean, these things is, is, are attributes of God. And what our culture has done is we have elevated sport as this idol that we worship. You know, it's this thing that's, that's out there. It's become a $420 billion industry. And... For me, in my own life, sport became that. It became that ultimate obsession. The sport of cycling, over time, I came to know Christ. So that, that moment where I heard and believed in the gospel and what I shared last night. And I don't know what it was for you, but for me, that, that happened at 12 years old. What's funny is I started my faith at 12. I also started my career and my sport at 12. And so I started this path and this journey with my relationship with God and a relationship with sport. And what I noticed over time was the farther I went in the sport, the direct opposite correlation, you know, if you have a graph, was my faith just went downhill. And so by the time I was 23 years old, a couple of years in the, the, just the UCI, lower level continental pro ranks, I basically never prayed. I never invited God into my sport. I never even thought about even worshiping him as I competed or as I trained. The concept that I'm going to talk about today, unfortunately, I feel almost hypocritical sharing it with you 
because this was not a reality in my life. And so I'm passionate about this topic today because it's my life and it's my testimony. And I want to share, do not do what I did. <laughs> and <clears throat> what it is, is what I did, and I couldn't really put an adjective to it or a word to it, but what it was at the core of my being and my soul was I put sport and cycling above God. And what that turns into is idolatry. It talks about in scripture, an idol is anything that we worship as a substitute for God. So it's putting anything really above him. It says in the scripture, it says, um, love the Lord God, the first commandment, love, love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You know, I did not do that. I was a Christian, and I thought, okay, God, I'm going to try to be an example in this sport, but at the root of my soul, all I wanted God to do for me was for me to be successful. Uh, so I pray on the start line, you know, of the race, God, help me stay safe so I wouldn't crash, and God, help me win today. You know, it was never, God, I want you to be glorified through my sport. God, I want to invite you today to be a part of this. God, thank you for giving me the opportunity to have these legs to pedal me down the road. Thank you for giving me air in my lungs for me to be able to propel myself down the road. I never had that perspective. And you know what? What you guys might have that experience of, of you might be worshiping your sport and not even realize it. And what I'm going to kind of walk through is in the Old Testament, we kind of hear this topic of idols in the passage of 1 Kings. And I'm not going to read the whole scripture, but in 1 Kings um, 18, 20 through 40, Elijah, a prophet from God. So God sent these prophets back in the Old Testament to basically be the messengers of what God wanted to tell his people, God's people, the Israelites. And what happened is God's people, the Israelites, God's chosen people, what they were doing is they worshipped him, but you know what? After three years of no rain, there was a drought in the land of Israel. And over time, they just got frustrated. You know, they're stopping their feet. And God, where are you? And we do this at times, right? When things don't go our way, no rain came. And so what they did is they started following this false idol named Baal. And then Baal had all these worshipers. And so they would pray to uh, Baal to send rain. And Elijah saw this, and he's like, I want you to turn your hearts back to God. That's what God wants to, wants to tell you. I love you. I care for you. Like we learned yesterday, turn back to me. I want your ultimate devotion to be directed towards me. And so Elijah, Elijah confronts these Baal worshipers in this kind of epic showdown. And we see in the passage. And the interesting thing is, what we find out from the scripture is that Baal was silent when these worshipers, they did 24 hours a day for a few days, just trying to cry out to Baal to send the rain down. And you know what? He was silent. Baal was powerless when they called out to him, showed no power. And then what you find in the scripture is they would cut themselves and it would be, they would have the destructive display of worship. And so Baal, what it was with this, this idol produced this destructive habits in their worshipers. And the interesting thing is, and I found this out to be very, very true, is if you worship sport and put it above everything else where it is your ultimate consumption, and an idol is anything that is good. So we learn at the very beginning that sport is good. I really do believe it. I think sport cycling is beautiful. God created it. I think it's amazing. But what happens is a good thing, when a good thing becomes the ultimate thing, that's when it becomes an idol. When it becomes the full consumption of your life, your heart, your soul, and you start to notice yourself, every, everything you ask for is selfish. Everything you care about is prideful. And I noticed that in my life. And what I found out is that the sport was silent in my life. It was powerless in my life. It was destructive in my life. At the end of my career, I hated my life. I didn't like where the person I was turning out to be. I had a, a, the Holy Spirit in my life convicting me of my sin. And I realized, you know, and I'm thankful to God to this day that I left 
is because is he it, I was unfulfilled. I was not joyful. And so the interesting thing is sport as an idol will bring out the worst in you and will never give you the fullest longings of your soul. It will never give the fulfillment that can only be found in the one true God, the God that we believe in, the God that we learned about last night that loves you deeply, <clears throat> loves you, and gave his life for you. And sport like Baal will prove to be silent, powerless, and destructive if you worship it. And the interesting thing is there's kind of, I think, a recipe. You know, if we're thinking about baking waffles, <laughs> you have ingredients, right? I think, there's, I think there's three major ingredients to kind of, I think, if you're thinking about maybe even this race season this year, just some things that you have to watch out for. And I don't think this is any surprise. And I especially think when I'm thinking of the context of this bike and the sport of especially pro cycling, you're going to notice that, wow, this is exactly what we've experienced for the past 20 years is, one, you have the first ingredient is extreme pressure. You have this pressure from coaches, from fans. I know I had pressure from people who helped me out as a really young cyclist. What I wanted to do is prove to them and say, thank you so much for giving me that bike when I was 16 years old. Thank you for paying that entry fee race for me. You know, these, and I felt like I had to prove to them that I can make it. You know, and so I had this pressure on myself and from outside forces as well. And then as I got higher and higher, you know, then there's pressure from, okay, if I don't, if I don't win this race, I don't get a pro contract next year. You know, there's, so there's this pressure and then there's influence, especially as we see, I mean, we have the pro cycling magazines. We have this influence. I mean, if you read about it, there's, there's the notoriety, there's the money, there's the fame, there's the awards. And, you know, for... Some of us, I think for a lot of cyclists, like Strava, you know, like I just want to be known as a good cyclist. You know, you don't have to be a professional. I mean, there's this like deep-seated need for our ego, right? Like, I want to get that KOM on Strava. And I'm like, why? You know, why do I have to prove anything to anyone anymore? And what we have seen, I think, is the biggest destructive thing in the sport is a passion to win at all costs. So I don't think we have to talk about it too much here in this room. If you follow this cycling in the past 15 years, you have seen this passion to win at all costs. I mean, I'm an American. I watched Lance Armstrong win seven Tour de France's, and you did too. And what, it, what at the end of the day, it was my identity is found in my seven Tour de France wins. My identity is found in my Live Strong Foundation. My identity is found in this. It's not in God. It's not in faith. It's in my sport. And what we've seen is, you know, to hold on to that so tightly, he would do whatever it takes. And so many other guys make that choice as well. The passion to win at all costs. And at the end of the day, pressure, influence, passion, win at all costs is going to equal this idolatry, this just ultimate worship at the end of the day to your sport and not to the one true God that we should have in worship. And so, what I want to, uh, I've got an analogy here <coughs> that I want to, uh, so, yes. So, you said three things. So, the first thing was extreme pressure. Yeah, extreme, extreme pressure, pressure was pressure. powerful influence. And the third is oh. passion to win at all costs. So, influence, or pressure, influence, and a passion to win at all costs. And I'm going to pull up Bear with me just for a couple seconds as I pull up uh, the next thing I want to share. Can you guys see it? A lunch tray? Do you see this? 
So, I don't know if you guys had this at school, but we